Good afternoon and welcome uh, on this beautiful, sunny <laughs> December day. Uh, my name is Geneviève Zubrzycki. I'm uh, the William H. Sewell Jr. Collegiate Professor of Sociology and Director of the Center for European Studies. Uh, and I'm delighted to, um, to welcome you this afternoon for this uh, distinguished lecture on Europe. The Center for European Studies is dedicated to improving understanding of European history and the European Union in the 21st century. CES brings together more than 100 faculty in more than 20 departments uh, across campus at the University of Michigan. These faculty affiliates regularly teach and conduct research on a wide variety of themes related to Europe, training the next generations of scholars in European studies. Each year, CES holds a distinguished lecture on Europe, and for this event, we ask a particularly interesting and broad-minded thinker to challenge us to think about Europe in new ways. Uh, Europe, its history, its current state, and its potential futures. And so I'm delighted to have Professor Philip Ter uh, to be giving the 2023 Distinguished Lecture on Europe. Professor Thayer is professor of, of Central European History at the University of Vienna, where he also founded the Research Center for the History of Transformations, uh, commonly known as RESET, for once like an acronym that's actually like really easy to remember, uh, accurate, and not, uh, yeah, unlike ACES, for example, the, our other association that. Um, he's widely published, very influential historian uh, scholar, and I will name just a few of his uh, books. Europe Since 1989, A History. The Dark Side of Nation States, Ethnic Cleansing in Modern Europe. Center Stage, Operatic Culture and Nation Building in 19th Century Central Europe. The Outsiders, Refugees in Europe Since 1492 or uh, How the West Lost the Peace, the Great Transformation sin, Since 1989. And Professor uh, Ter publishes both with uh, the most prestigious um, academic presses, uh, Princeton University Press, uh, Purdue University Press, or also with more uh, presses that have greater public outreach, such as, such as Polity Press. In 2019, he was awarded the Wittgenstein Prize by the Austrian Research Fund, which is the highest recognition for scientists in Austria. So we're extremely pleased to have him uh, today deliver this important uh, lecture and to talk to us about the mass flight from and in Ukraine, a game changer in international refugee and migration history, question mark. So please join me in offering a very warm welcome to Philip Ter. Well, thank you for the very uh, generous introduction. Thanks for having me. Um, I was really glad when I received this invitation because I was always curious about uh, University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, uh, but there were, never was an, an occasion. And I, I recall when I was working at another CES back then, that at Harvard, uh, where Andrew Port was also working at the time, who is here. Um, well, um, there was you know various guest talks, and 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 I observed that um, well. The, the very best and most interesting talks were given by colleagues from University of Michigan. Um, and I recall that. And the other thing is, of course, as a big state university, you know, University of Vienna, uh, well, you know, the, the Germans and Austrians, quite often they have the Ivies in mind when they think about excellence, but I think that's the wrong point of reference. I mean, the really excellent big state universities, that's the one we should aspire to be uh, close to, and so thanks for having me, and I'm really looking forward uh, to the discussion as well. Um, now, what can a historian uh, tell um, about the Russian war against Ukraine and the accompanying mass flight? Uh, both the war and the mass flight have not receded yet into history, and um, so this conventional war is still in full swing, and 
as many times in history, mass flight, well, it went a little bit down, but it is also still um, occurring. Why? Because it is used as a weapon to weaken um, the enemy. Now, the media focus on the military warfare um, on the multiple fronts in symbolic places like uh, Bahmut, Avdiyevka and so on, um, that of course always presents pictures of destroyed housing blocks, damaged civilian infrastructure, um, and then artillery and, and all that, whereas mass flight um, is much less reported on. So it is also badly damaging and uprooting millions of people. There was a bout of that, of course, in March 22, right, when most people tried to get out and then in the, sp in the spring. But since then, we don't hear much about that. Um, however, there's uh, a strategy uh, behind the Russian war crimes and, and gen genocidal acts. Because if there are less or no people left close to the military fronts, this is cutting off supply and support for the Ukrainian army. And this actually, this civilian grassroots support is so pivotal, it's providing winter clothes, um, they're cooking shelters, so there's so many things provided pre precisely because the Ukrainian state is not a very strong and effective one. And um, so, you know, getting people to run away near the front lines, of course, is a, is a part of, of this military strategy. Now, uh, the mass flight also damages the economic potential of Ukraine and therefore will weaken the country in the long run. And so this is an issue which goes beyond just uh, the 14, 16 millions, I mean the numbers always vary, directly affected people. Um, and it has, as I stressed, an impact on the long-term potential of Ukraine uh, to resist the Russian war of, of aggression. Now, what can historians do in this dire situation is to look into the past to show possible parallels and maybe draw some lessons of them. Now, of course, learning from history and on a political level is a very ambitious undertaking. Um, it requires clear messages and communication channels to political leaders and, and usually they don't listen to keynote speeches and, and, and of course, not to, uh, to historians. And um, then, of course, I must also add in a rather depressed manner that, that if you see, you know, that positive learning from history, how it has been turned upside down, um, it looks like a distant utopia. I mean, take the amateur historian residing in the Kremlin who has taken and actively propagates only the wrong lessons from history. But, but, but nevertheless, I think it's a duty to, to, um, uh, of academic historians to Contradict, uh, to, to contradict, first of all, these open lies about history and to convey some positive or maybe productive conclusions and, and messages of what needs to be done. Now, of course, I don't refer here to the Shlodi uh, Alat by the Vladimir Ilyich, um, um, but, but I, I have the feeling very often that um, in this war and the confrontation, Vienna is quite close. Um, are we getting what is at stake? I mean, is the West really trying to resist this nihilistic, deeply nihilistic onslaught? And this, I'll be really aware of what is ha going to happen if Russia wins that war, if, if Ukraine uh, loses it. Um, but, um, well, there's of course also the humanitarian dimension to all that. Um, especially considering um, mass flight. Now, refugees are, as you all know, uh, covered by um, an edifice of international humanitarian law. Um, but however, that, that has been so blatantly broken so many times since February uh, 22. Um, so one should add here that it has been severely violated already since the annexation of Crimea and the Russian intervention in eastern Donbass in 2014. Um, but there is also a utilitarian dimension to mass flight from and, and within Ukraine. And I will put that into a second question that <coughs> is rarely asked in discussions about mass flight and also in most books, um, what can be done to help not only the refugees, but also the country of origin. Uh, because after all, this is a terrible drain on, of, of human capital. And, and I think it should, 
motivate us also to rethink uh, something very old, uh, repatriation, or maybe we should rather speak about return and um, what is needed to, to do that. Now, return has not only this international dimension, I mean, there's this uh, restriction of, of the term refugee to being international transporter. Of course, it affects as much the IDPs, which were much present in Ukraine, of course, since Russia started its first war against Ukraine in 2014, but then in the West almost nobody watched. Um, now, these two questions, um, what to do about the refugees, but also what, uh, how to help um, possibly Ukraine, and then, of course, the major thing contained in the title, these three questions will guide my, my talk. Um, now, historical analogies are always problematic and be misleading, but I'll try to reach some conclusions by looking further back in time than just 2014, which I mentioned now. Um, I will particularly refer in the second part of my talk to the wars of Yugoslav succession in the 1990s because there are some interesting but also frightening parallels with the current situation. And then from time to time I will pertain to World War II because um, this is the right reference if we look at the dimensions, I mean in terms of number um, of um, the um, the predicament we are seeing now and the Russian war against Ukraine and the mass flight resulting from it. Um, so between 14 and 16 million displaced people, if we take together the IDPs and the, and the international refugees, of course show the dimension of the whole thing. And there are very few precedents in European or global history um, that actually a third of the population of a country have been uprooted. Um, this is quite unique. At the end of World War II, around 12 million, so a lower number of ethnic Germans, were put to flight. Um, around the same number of people after the misguided and mismanaged partition of British India in 1947. I was dealing with all that in the, in the refugee book. Um, but nevertheless, the amount of uh, displaced Ukrainians uh, surpasses these two disasters. And uh, of course, in Germany and India, uh, British India had a larger population, um, uh, much larger than, than Ukraine has today. So, uh, you know, proportionally, this is obviously um, a, a, a bigger problem. Now let's uh, switch on the, the title here and immediately move to the, um, to the next slide. Um, now, what you can see here is a famous picture, of course, so I could download it for free from, from Wiki Commons. And this is the famous bridge in Irpin, uh, with the mass of refugees, you know, trying to escape uh, below the bridge. And when this picture was taken, um, all uh, the genocidal mass murder happening in Irpin uh, was not, not known yet. Um, now, why am I putting up this picture? Because it shows that, well, first of all, this started as an internal problem in Ukraine. Um, and actually, there are more IDPs, um, as far as known as, at least as many as refugees uh, to, to neighboring countries. Now, the IDPs are always in a worse situation because they don't fall under the Geneva Convention for Refugees and in general get much less international attention and, and, and support. And as I mentioned, this was especially true for the 1.5 million people arriving from eastern Donbass who, however, galvanized then the Ukrainian resistance against the Russian intervention. Um, and, well, in spite of that problem, of course, then as we all know, um, the West and in particular Germany uh, continued their appeasement policy towards uh, Russia and the economic collaboration. Um, well, um, then, you know, you have, this is the Moldovian border. Um, and then in here, you even see some international involvement in Ukraine, the Red Cross um, uh, trying to to help. Now, um, in spite of the gravity of the problem, actually I would say the response in Europe and not only neighboring Poland uh, or Slovakia or Romania was actually, if you put it into a longer dimension, time dimension, it was surprisingly positive. 
I mean, these kind of open doors you find rarely in in the in European in European history. Um, sometimes, by the way, there has been then the accusation in debates that there might have been a racialized preference for white refugees, right? Uh, because the Ukraine is, after all, a European Christian and so on. Um, but I, I, I think that is mistaken, because even if there had been a, 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 a preference, then that doesn't mean that this results automatically in the discrimination of, of other refugees. And so, you know, denouncing this as something wrong doesn't change anything uh, to the better in other cases of accepting migrants or refugees or not. Now, why uh, these open doors? Um, I think it's very clear and obvious to state that there was this dichotomy between um, Russia as a perpetrator and Ukraine as a victim, and so there was a clear moral stance. However, in some countries much more clear, for example, if you take the Czech Republic, immediately there was a reaction, um, whereas in Austria it was uh, belated and sometimes um, I felt outright ashamed. Why? Uh, there was not such a direct, um, you know, um, direction, a di direct reaction to to that. But nevertheless, overall, okay, uh, the clear dichotomy created a lot of moral outrage, and 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 that certainly helped um, because there was not such a gray zone like you have it in every case of mass flight when people come from a country uh, which is more or less in civil war. Now, a civil war is a problematic term because uh, what does it mean? It always tends to be one side being more aggressive than the other side or one side outright starting it. But um, nevertheless, if you have a civil war-like situation, then the distinction between culprits and victims is less clear. Um, you also don't always know whom you might get. Um, for example, former regime functionaries from Syria or um, radical Islamists. So um, all that was absent in Ukraine working in the favor of um, of the Ukrainian refugees. Now they also had a clear reason of flight as uh, the victims of a war of aggression. And then of course also war crimes as we then later were to, to got to learn and even local cases of genocide. Now there's a huge debate about what, what is genocidal about that war and, and what not. Um, I will come to come back to that later on. A second major factor for the open doors was that it was a gendered flight, uh, but not gendered in, in, in the same way like in 2015-16, when mostly male refugees came, but the most vulnerable, so uh, women and children predominantly, now for a variety of reasons, Ukrainian legislation and so on, um, but nevertheless that also certainly uh, aroused sympathies because this was obviously closer to the culture of the receiving countries, right? I mean, we all know the Titanic uh, miss, okay, women and children first, right? So, um, um, then a third thing um, was um, a legal precedences, which is then getting more to the core of my talk, and I would here pertain to the historical experience of the Yugoslav Wars of Succession. Um, so the um, uh, adoption, or the, we can say the, the en en enlargement, the emulation of the Geneva Convention for Refugees for the victims of war in the 1990s was uh, working in 2022 as a blueprint for uh, a legal solution in favor of the Ukrainians. Um, now there's one disclaimer which I always have to make. I mean, this initial openness might not last. I mean, very many times in cases of mass flight, then over time you find kind of uh, a changing mood or a, a tipping point or some uh, political parties trying to, to change the mood. Um, then there's um, other, I would say, problems. Um, I mean, there's always this imagination in the receiving countries that a refugee needs to be poor and deserving. And then especially in Vienna, where, you know, the, the western hub of the oligarchs besides Switzerland, um, you see a, a, a quite a lot of 
quite many rich Ukrainians, you know, coming in huge SUVs, Porsches, and so on. Um, and that is, that is not in line with the picture of, you know, the classical humanitarian UNHCR, poor uh, refugees. Then over time, what is uh, always problematic for changing the moods about refugees is comp competition for jobs in some sectors. Um, usually, of course, not in academia, which might be one of the reasons why academics are more pro-refugees, right? We um, hardly face the competition of, from arriving people. We, well, we might welcome them, and especially Ukrainian program. But it's, of course, something different if you work in construction industry or as a cab driver. Um, and then um, another negative factor playing out um, is, I would say, a general turn against refugees from uh, the far right, but then partially taken over by conservative parties, more mainstream, um, undermining the legitimacy of refugees at large, but also of Ukrainian refugees. Um, something which we have also seen recently has been this aforementioned anti-racism of the left uh, claiming that the Ukrainians are treated better than people from Africa or the Middle East, and I think this is uh, creating hmm, a strange division based on, on envy, so that, that, that also might uh, create a, a, a backlash. Um, but, but let's come back to the, to the legal grounds for openness. Um, well, what the Ukrainians got when they arrived was a collective acknowledgement as a persecuted nation or a, a population, modeled, I would argue, after the Croatian and then uh, Bosnian refugees who came um, in the beginning of the 1990s. Um, but let's now make us another round. Um, um, about this mass flight, because there's again parallels to the case uh, of Bosnia and Herzegovina and, and initially Croatia. Um, you know, what is mass flight? Um, is it just an, you know, a part of a war which is led against civilian, or is it more? And I would like to stress that this was uh, from the very beginning a tool of the Russian war of aggression, much like the Serbian war of aggression. Um, in Croatia and then Bosnia and Herzegovina. So what you have is the shock and awe strategy. Uh, by the way, practiced most effectively by the Nazis uh, after the invasion of France um, in, in 1940. I mean, if you have a mass flight of millions of people clogging the streets, then this is obviously an obstacle for the army of the defending country bringing resources to the front and all that. So this was for sure an attention um, of the Russian army didn't quite play out. I mean, it's, it's really, in retrospect, it's quite remarkable how Ukraine was able to manage such a number of refugees, kind of contradicting maybe uh, what I said before, that the country is usually considered as a weak state, not that weak maybe, and, and especially strong in the civilian and civil society response. Um, well, mass flight uh, usually is also a, a tool of a combination of military and ethnic cleansing. I mean, the cleansing is such, is uh, rooted as uh, a, relig a religious term, uh, but there's also a military um, uh, tradition, we might say. Uh, so to cleanse out, to control, completely control the territory you conquer. Um, I mentioned it before, uh, the goal of that is cutting off the civilian support for the Ukrainian army. Um, then another goal for sure, uh, besides you know, all the gas and energy threat trying to destabilize the European Union was, uh, okay, you create a humanitarian crisis and then hope that um, that will weaken uh, the second enemy in the whole game, which is of course not only Ukraine, but also the EU or the West at large. Uh, the EU, I always keep on repeating that, maybe here it's not needed, but uh, in Austria it is needed and in Germany as well, um, that, it is this, that this is really understood. Um, now, mass flight, what we saw in Yugoslavia and what we're seeing here again, is that it is accompanied and reinforced by crimes against humanity and genocide, 
Now, if you look at the rulings and the court proceedings at the International Court for the former Yugoslavia um, at, at, at The Hague in the late 90s and then the, uh, the early millennium, um, um, the, the basically the bottom line of all those court proceedings was that um, most acts were ruled as severe crimes against humanity, of course still bringing the perpetrators uh, behind the bars, and rightly so, um, whereas the rulings that this was a genocide, so an in, you know, in intentional mass killing of um, the adversary population, that was mostly restricted to Srebrenica. So um, you can say local cases where th this could be proven, right? So it was rather a narrow interpretation of the term genocide, more narrow than actually have it in the genocide convention. Um, nevertheless, um, um, you know, um, Irpin, Butcher, and so on, uh, that certainly qualifies as um, a genocide. And of course, the rhetoric and the ultimate goals of the war are uh, genocidal. But then, in the later course of the war, you also see that they're backing off from um, that kind of um, 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 heavy um, genocidal warfare, so further east in the, in the Donbass front, when they conquered areas, so there um, it was a little well, a little bit more restrictive, you can, um, you can say. Um, nevertheless, uh, the result was all the same. Uh, the, genocidal, the, the genocidal acts, I mean, some of them are hidden, but some of them are very open um, in order to motivate still other people to run away, right? That they see what might be coming, and that also then reinforced um, the mass flight um, in Ukraine. And Previously, it could be compared, as I argued, um, uh, with um, uh, in former Yugoslavia. Now, um, um, let's now turn our attention to the Yugoslav case. Um, in 92, 91, late 91, you have the first tens of thousands and then soon more than 100,000 refugees from Croatia um, arriving either in the remnant territories of Croatia, but, but above all going transborder, so um, Hungary, Slovenia, and then um, arriving in Austria, and then from Austria onwards, but uh, quite many also stayed. And um, um, here you see, sorry that this is in German, I couldn't find um, another, uh, I couldn't find this in English. Uh, but anyway, the, you see, you know, the uh, almost half of these refugees were eventually um, arriving in Germany. Um, why? Uh, because also there had been massive labor migration previously in the 60s and up to the mid 70s. So there's always an itinerary and in that way flight migration and labor migration very often are connected. Uh, that flight migrants go where before labor migrants have arrived. Um, but in fact, I mean, if you uh, break it down to the size of the population, then Austria, Sweden, and also the Netherlands um, had a higher intake of refugees. Now, what did all these countries do? And then the European, um, well, first community, but then Union, Austria was not a member yet. Um, they um, accepted, basically accepted war as a reason for mass flight, um, which is not written into the Geneva Convention. In the Geneva Convention, it needs to be, you know, the religious, da, 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 whatever, discrimination, ethnic, but um, not war as such. So this was basically an opening of the Geneva Convention. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as a part of this collective acceptance of the refugee, there was a time limitations. So they got in, they also got in, well, it differs from country to country, but they got relatively quick labor permit. So there was also integration in the labor market. But at the same time, there was this clear signal, if um, the war ends, you will have to return home. So the repatriation um, was um, loomed large. Now, 
Um, so it, it has kind of a double phase, right? Um, on the one hand, an opening of the Geneva Convention. On the other hand, a restricting of the time um, dimension. Uh, however, then the practice of repatriation after the Dayton Peace Agreement in 95, uh, that differed quite a lot. So Germany um, sent most of the Yugoslav refugees home, repatriated them, um, very often, by the way, against their will. So this is why you got then uh, demonstrations like, uh, what's happening here? Hmm. I don't know. Did, uh, uh, maybe I used the tabulator, no. Hmm. Try again. OK, here we go. Thank you. Um, so the practice was quite different. So Germany, which at the time was in an economic crisis, uh, basically wanted to get rid of these refugees, even if they were quite well integrated into the labor market, kids went to school. So 90% of the Yugos post Yugoslavs, so mostly Croatians and, and Bosnians, but also some Serbs, were sent back home. So here you find the demonstrations against that, right? Um, saying that, okay, 80% of the refugees can return back home because their homelands are still Serb-occupied, referring to the Republika Srpska as one of the parts of then the federal Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, so, any, you know, some referring to places where they couldn't return to, like Brčko, the, uh, the corridor, um, and so on. Uh, it didn't help much. Um, Austria and Sweden had a different course of action, and Sweden basically kept all ref the refugees if they wanted to stay. Austria had kind of a utilitarian premise. If the refugees could earn their own money, basically, if they were integrated well enough in the labor market and had a sufficient income to keep up the families, then they were not sent home. Um, why is this important? Because um, this is actually a mix of a humanitarian and a utilitarian approach, right? Initially humanitarian, taking the refugees under new premises by basically uh, opening up the Geneva uh, Convention, uh, and then um, letting them stay on utilitarian premises. Now, by the way, this had very positive economic effects. It, that can be proven statistically, uh, an impact on growth, um, but also lifting the entire former guest worker population from Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia, in social and economic statistics. So this had previously been rather a peasant, medium or lower education uh, population, and that very often was then uh, transposed to the next generation. And now you had a lot of educated people, an own elite, which then helped, of course, other countrymen uh, to get a better education. Um, and so all in all, this was, I think, a very um, positive experience. Of course, not, not in every single case. I mean, if a, if, uh, a female doctor uh, and then the, you know, the doctor's diploma is not accepted and the person had to work as a nurse or uh, the owner of a company um, and then you know, working as an employee, um, an engineer doing uh, low-skilled jobs, so there was also a loss of human capital, but at the same time um, an increase. Now, even uh, if I think this humanitarian and utilitarian approach nowadays should be remembered as a positive example, it had one negative effect. It contributed to the bleeding out of the country of origin. Um, Bosnia overall um, lost more than one million mostly highly or above average qualified population as a course of the war or uh, then in the 1990s who continued to emigrate because the situation was so bad. And I think there is also a very imminent danger um, that the same might happen to Ukraine. 
um, with again all you know the negative um, um, impact I've I've talked about eventually weakening the potential of resisting uh, the Russian Federation, which is I guess likely to continue that war for a long, long time, given the fact that the first um, Russian war of aggression in 2014, I mean, it never really ended. It went on and on and on on various levels until there came the big invasion. Um, <clears throat> and in general, of course, it is much more difficult for a country of 25 million people around, I mean, if you really count the population still remaining there and being active, uh, to resist in a country of 40 or 45 million, um, facing a country of 140 million. So the whole repatriation issue, um, I think it is looming large for Ukraine and it is very um, important and um, um, but it needs to it should be managed in a different way than in the 1990s. Um, now if I compare uh, Bosnia and Ukraine, of course one always needs to keep the different um, proportions in mind, right? Um, so Ukraine has uh, um, used to have before the war a population which was almost not, well nine nine times larger than that of Bosnia and and, and Herzegovina. However, if you look at the four of, of the full war situation, then uh, we can see uh, again frightening parallels. I mean, the aggressor back then Serbia, now Russia operates from a territory almost untouched by the war. Um, the war is happening almost entirely in the territory of Ukraine. Um, so that is where you really have an emergency situation. Whereas in Russia, well, you know, the sanctions, living standards might sink, but um, th this did not lead to the demise of Milosevic in the 1990s. It came only much later as a result of the NATO invasion. And, uh, obviously, Russia's nuclear blackmail is working. Nobody dares to attack the country or just, you know, the catch bridge or whatever um, you have. Um, and one should add here that even major defeats uh, of the Serbs, like in Croatia in '95, it did not lead to a breakdown of the regime. It, it, it remained intact until the next war was lost. Why? Because uh, all the warfare created the myth of victimhood, uh, confirming the previous, we are being victimized by, you know, um, and also the arrival of the Serbian refugees, the rising number of casualties. Um, it, in a way, it reinforced um, nationalism. And so I'm, I'm skeptical this, if I see all these predictions that, you know, regime change in Russia, the country might fall apart. If it, if it happens, then maybe quickly and unexpectedly, but um, I, don't, I don't really see it. Um, uh, we rather see how the regime is able to, um, well, build on that mess of the Great Patriotic War, repeating it that this is a second Great Patriotic War. And as I said, I think the decreasing living standards, um, that's not, not such a major problem. Uh, plus, the international context is much more beneficial for Russia. You know, they have uh, Trojan horses in the West, like Turkey, like, like Hungary, undermining the sanctions. Then they have a friend, a powerful China, bystanders in the global south. Um, and Russia is not um, really um, isolated. What can we conclude for Ukraine? There might be a continuation of mass flight, especially if the front lines change and also um, the people who who have left and might want to return, um, um, well, they, they, they're going to be very, very hesitant to do that. I, mean, I can just see as a, as a glimpse, you know, we had a Ukrainian uh, support program at the University of Vienna at Reset, and um, for scholars, now that's a selected group, maybe they need the help even less than, than, than other people, but we tried our best. and. Out of the 15 people we had, one returned out of patriotism, basically. Um, the others didn't. And the longer, of course, they will stay abroad, the lower the probability that they might return. There's also many other problems for, um, for Ukraine. An, an imminent rising inflation, 
um, because how can they finance the war? I mean, the West just helps uh, with military uh, materials, but but it's not financing Ukraine's state budget and and you know a lot of other costs related to to the war. Um, so prospects are not that great, I think. Um, now let's come to the third part of my talk. Mm. And this is international refugee law. And mm, what we have seen, hmm. ah, this was too quick. Um, OK. A quick run through um, international refugee law. I think quite often um, the significance um, of the interwar period is overlooked. We, you know, we tend to refer always to the Geneva Convention, but actually um, the High Commissioner for Refugees was established first for the Russian case, but then this Russian was dropped, and I mean this was the man which, whom you see in the corner, Friedrich of Nansen. Um, so there was already a, a High Commissioner for Refugees who, however, operated on a case-to-case -case basis. So first the Russians, then the Armenians, and the Syrians, and so on, uh, later on from Germany. Um, and I think, however, um, the, the, the differences then to what happened after the war are gradual. What we see then in the 51 Geneva Convention is a universalization. Okay, So it's not a case-based approach, but something which was already looming in the interwar period, a universal approach to all kinds of refugees. Now, as probably you all know, there were spatial and temporal limitations. So temporal meaning the refugees up to that time, and spatial Europe. But then there was this supplementary protocol in 1967. Um, it has this gray name, right, insignificant name, but it brought a globalization of this refugee uh, legislation. And, um, and so therefore, many more cases were covered by uh, the Refugee Convention. We have 1989, which has a double-faced impact. On the one hand, the rise of humanitarianism, human rights discourse, and all that. Um, on the other hand, closure. Uh, because so many people arrived back then from the East. And you can see the closure in various countries. Austria, again, rather not that famous, um, um, introducing a visa regime for Romanians and Poles. Germany closing down the, the, the border to, well, seemingly post-German, but de facto post-Soviet refugees. Uh, so it is a mixed thing. Uh, the Yugoslav case, I mentioned it. So on the one hand, a widening. On the other hand, a time limitation. Um, but still, overall, um, you see that um, uh, the, the international refugee legislation, also in other areas, um, accepting sexual discrimination, uh, gang violence, all sorts of other things, as a, as a legitimate reason of flight, we see this enlargement. What did not increase I think it was the readiness to accept more refugees, not in the United States, not in Europe. So this went then out of sync, one can say. Um, and so in the so-called refugee crisis, for Europe it was not a refugee crisis in terms of numbers. In 2015-16, this was mainly a political refugee crisis because they couldn't agree upon what to do with the refugees from the Near East, the Middle East. Um, in the refugee crisis in 2015-16, um, all these discrepancies um, caused part of that problem of the political crisis. I mean, nobody, especially Merkel, did want to close the borders, um, especially the Schengen borders. So the internal borders of Europe were kept open for a while, but then came this backlash, right? Um, and um, so the, uh, it rather tilted into, so to say, uh, the second, the more negative side of the post-89 or the post yugoslav um, perception and, and, and legal solutions for, uh, for, for refugees. Um, 
There was a certain reinvigoration through the U United Nations Refugee Pact, which was accompanied by the Migration Pact. I'm not talking about this in my talk. By the way, I'm in, in general, I'm just a historian, but I, uh, legal issues are not my specialization. I'm also not an intellectual historian, so um, I'm probably not the right person to, to talk too much about that. Um, but the reinvigoration in the sense that uh, the Refugee Convention got confirmed and in certain aspects also enlarged, however, always with this time limitation in mind. Um, but given the backlash in 2015-16, I think the openness for the Ukrainians and the, you know, the reaction to the Ukrainian refugee crisis, which for Europe was really a refugee crisis, is remarkably um, positive. Now, um, what is the situation we are confronted with, or the, above all the Ukrainian um, refugees are confronted with? Um, so, the openness on legal grants, there was again this collective solution, okay, they all uh, received as refugees of a war, um, and that helped a lot to get them um, an allowance to stay, legal papers. I mean, this really worked quickly. Um, I also know it from my own experience, you know, when the Ukrainians um, arrived in Vienna, it was not difficult to help them hmm, in all these legal measures. Uh, they quickly received a card, um, giving them access to uh, simple welfare provisions to the labor market, so, and, and Austria was not the most open country or the most unbureaucratic one. Um, so all that worked well, and so theoretically the Ukrainians also had quick access to the labor market. Now, one and a half years later, however, um, it is quite interesting to see how much the statistics in the factual labor market integration diverge. So in the Czech Republic, I think it has among the highest proportions of Ukrainians working, in spite of the fact that it took in such a high number of refugees, also in proportion to its own population, 60-70% of Ukrainian refugees are really working, which is remarkable given the fact that so many of them are women, uh, very often with small kids. So this is really huge success. In Germany and Austria, um, it is uh, hovering between 20 and 30 percent, and also that might seem as a paradox here, the welfare state is rather a problem instead of a solution. So they are disincentivized to enter the labor market. Uh, the basic payments, are also they are not on the same level like for indigenous welfare recipients, uh, they are on such, an, on such a high level um, that it's not really worth taking up a job. And if so, then rather you know, on the side, but not officially. And actually, we made an experience of that at Reset. Um, we got an emergency program from the city of Vienna, uh, 5,000 euros per uh, refugee scholar. Not a bad amount of money, right? You can buy a computer, um, you might rent a better apartment, but then, if the refugees were staying in a subsidized emergency housing, if they were, if they were receiving um, these basic welfare payments, then they could not receive these 5,000 euros because then they would, have fall out, they would fall out of all these schemes. So leave, um, you know, they would have to leave the, um, the, the emergency housing, they would not get uh, all these emergency payments anymore. And so this was crazy, right? And uh, we made appeals, uh, we wrote to the ministry, but there was no will to change that. Um, why? Because in the end, keeping up the, a facade of a protective welfare state for the indigenous populations, for the bio-Austrians, uh, was more important than really doing something about the refugees. Um, well, then what we did was paying out the money at the very, in between, you know, paying out lo a, a very low sum in the legal limit, and then at the end, the whole money, and then they just could take it and 
and leave or buying stuff. So there was a solution, but it was really difficult to help them. That's kind of crazy. So because of all these uh, welfare state provisions. Um, now, um, 5,000 euros or any other sum is a lot of money if you return to Ukraine, where the purchasing power of that money is, of course, much higher. And, and I think um, with the money the Ukrainians are receiving, it depends on the family status, but it can vary from 500 to up uh, over 1,000 euros, depending how many children and so on. Um, this is expensive for the recipient states. Um, if you will transfer half that amount of money f to somebody returning to Ukraine, it would have a much bitter, bigger impact. And so I think um, what could be done is indeed foster voluntary remigration. Remigration. Now there is this funny twist in our languages um, that okay, you have migration, remigration but there is no flight and reflight. <laughs> um, why? Because if you then, um, well, if you return to your home country, then of course, under the premise that it is safe again and that we count as a migration. Um, so um, even the languages give us a clue what is at, what is at stake here. Um, but um, uh, I think what, what really could and should be done is really, um, and, and here I get to the possible innovations, um, through the war against Ukraine. Um, well, one we have seen, right? The collective intake of refugees. That has been repeated, but I still perceive it as innovation. Uh, compared to the so-called refugee crisis in 2015, fast labor market integration. Um, and now we come to this point, you know, voluntary remigration instead of enforced repatriation. I mean, what do people need to return? Um, repair the roof of a house, put in, you know, new windows if they're bombed out in their apartment. So very often, uh, small, medium-sized repairs and um, that could indeed be supported. Um, and, well, there was some support in the Yugoslav case that people would get a lump sum payment or something, but, um, but this was not an across-the-board uh, solution. And um, so if one thinks about the voluntary remigration, then I think it should be um, incentivized. Um, another thing, and that is connected to that, is a focus on the country of departure. When the refugees were repatriated to Bosnia in the 1990s, in the late 1990s, uh, German authorities hardly thought about Bosnia. If they had so, then um, they would have had a you know, much larger provision than just sending them home to where they came from, which was quite unrealistic especially for uh, Bosniaks returning to still Serb rule territory, which is, by the way, also true for Srebrenica, um, or Croats. And um, so it might be that people cannot return to their original place where they came from, but then obviously maybe they could return somewhere else, especially given the fact that so many Ukrainians also left other areas than uh, the immediate uh, war zones. Um, and, well, to repeat um, what I said before, I think indeed Ukraine needs this kind of perspective because otherwise the prospects uh, for the war but also for a possible post war situation are really bad. Accelerated demographic decline. Um, uh, of course, then also based on that uh, slow growth and so on. Um, now, remigration, what does it mean uh, according to international refugee law? People are accepted on the premise that they had a reason to escape, right? Uh, and in the immediate case of persecution, if you then remigrate, um, then you lose 
obviously that reason for being um, accepted in the West again. And this is again a terrible situation for people. You know, some of them did return last fall, 22, but then came the hard winter with the Russians bombing the civilian infrastructure and so on. If you have then small children, it is really hard, right? So they might want to return, but then what is not clear yet is whether they would get the refugee status again. As of now, rather not. Okay, so this is an, at least an unclear um, legal situation. And so a part of the incentivization of the remigration therefore needs to be that this should not be a one-way road, okay, but leading to free movement. Now, the drawback of that is, of course, that you then water down um, the legal distinction between refugee law and something else, right? Because the free movement would not be based um, on the Geneva Convention, but there would need to be other legal uh, provisions. Um, now, all these considerations are utilitarian. I mean, there, there might be some moral premises like helping Ukraine and so on, but, but de facto they're utilitarian. And I think that stands in the contrast with um, the predominance of humanitarianism, uh, which has driven refugee policies all around uh, since 1951, but even more so over time. There has been this, there has been this increasing um, humanitarian tilt. And I think that also should be reconsidered. It might be good for doing fundraising for the UN, for the UNHCR, where you can get you know the usual picture of the desperate refugee. Um, but what does it do? I mean, it turns refugees into mere objects of history and not subjects, which of course they are. Um, it is also backfiring this stress only on the humanitarian agenda because as we, I think, have learned or should learn since 2015, um, the far right is putting that on the top Okay, the poor refugee is basically a bad migrant. Why? Because he's a needy migrant and this is then supposedly to the detriment of the indigenous population. And so also part of the backsliding, as we call it in academia, is actually a backfiring of that. And a closer look at history um, might have prevented that. Actually, um, a Jewish help and refugee organizations in the U.S. in this country in 1921 and 24, when all the well, migration, immigration legislation, not the refugee legislation, was uh, made stricter and stricter, they restrained actually from uh, referring to the poor, needy, desperate refugee because they sensed that this is backfiring. The Jewish help organizations knew it. And so I wonder why um, uh, we don't recognize that. Um, it also um, is in contradiction the needy refugee with the simple fact that very often there is a social selection procedure behind who is able to flee. It requires intellectual resources and money. And I mentioned the Yugoslavs, which had a far above education and of course the same is true for the Ukrainians. They're high qualified. This is of course also the reasons why Ukraine um, needs them. But again, you know, we have these um, then these counter reactions. Okay, the rich Ukrainian refugee coming with this SUV, this is beyond the imagination. Uh, of course these people got down to their cars on the very morning, I know two of them, uh, after the invasion and they got into the car and they were driving those, uh, depending where they came from, um, one or two thousand miles straight from Dnipro to Vienna, for example. Um, how can that be done, this redirection of a humanitarian approach and the further innovation in dealing with refugees? Probably not on a global law, but I think it could be done, and that's why I'm happy to speak um, at
a CES, right? Um, I think it can be done, it should be done at the EU level um, through a simple mechanism. Um, Ukraine needs at least a partial accession to the European Union because then also the issue of free movement will be resolved with a hand stroke, right? If that is a country at least affiliated with the European Union or having partial membership, let's say in the defense union, an older part, by the way, of the European unions, it once upon a time was communities in different areas, um, uh, then why not have, you know, um, an accession, a partial membership also um, in the labor markets and therefore allowing the free mobility. Um, but I'm not a political advisor, I'm only a historian, and so I don't know um, whether that message makes a lot of sense, maybe here and for the discussion. Um, so thank you for your attention, and now I'm looking forward to your questions and remarks. Yourself, or do you want me to? Um, you can share. That would be a pleasure. Yeah. You want yeah. To? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. So we have time for uh, questions. Uh, we have two people there, and I will take uh, the queue. And I encourage students to ask their questions first. If no students. Okay, sir, I know that you wanted to ask something also. If you don't mind saying your name. Oh, I'm Alan Boyce. I'm from Dexter, Michigan. I'm a chiropractic physician. Um, uh, what have you seen in our recent history uh, when you were talking about the repatriation uh, in uh, the Yugoslavian wars? What kind of time period are we talking? Ten years, twenty years, mm -hmm. uh, a generation and a half? How many people become born, you know, children of people that are displaced, and the difficulties that occurred during that time? Excuse me. Okay, thanks a lot. And you, you decide, you know, the, the, uh, direct S answers or collecting. Or? Uh, let's collect. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll take three, and then mm -hmm. that will be. So let's. Um, yes, in the back. Oh, Lilith is a student. Well, you're still a student. I, I am a student, just didn't want Wonderful. to be the first one. So thank you okay. for opening up. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for the lecture and for the parallels. I find it very interesting, and it shows um, the interconnectedness of the different regions and the consequences of the power dynamics that happened and what is happening now. I just wanted to bring in another region to this because in my mind I was com constantly comparing it to the South Caucasus, particularly the Georgian mm -hmm. South Ossetia there with the differences, but also very, um, I think many similarities to what, what comes to the displacement, be it the ITP, IDPs or the refugees. Um, I just had one question, as you mentioned, for Russia, um, moving the civilians was also a tool uh, to discourage the Ukrainian army, right? On the other hand, it seems like this is then a way for Ukraine, the state, uh, to support its own army. So it's only in the interest of the Ukrainian state to send back the people to their original places. I don't know if this is happening in Ukraine, but it did happen in Georgia and Ossetia. So the Georgian state, um, did very immediately, right after the ceasefire, send its people uh, to mm -hmm. the border regions when it wasn't safe for the people to go yet. They were mines, etc. So mm -hmm. there were many casualties happening. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering what is and the question that you asked about um, what can we do for the original states? Uh, to make sure mm -hmm. that it's good for them as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. What about the people? Um, so is there a way where uh, what we can do both for the original state and for the people mm -hmm. uh, they meet in our current order of the world? So what can Europe do for this? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you so much. This is um, so fascinating and, and engaging. I have a question sort of partly based on, on, on family experience. So in the 1990s, my parents in Germany used to tutor um, uh, refugees from Bosnia and, and, um, and Croatia in German. And subsequently, most of those they have been working with back then have left Germany, but not returning to the former Yugoslavia, but moving on to Canada. 
mm-hmm. most of the time. So that makes me curious, what, how does secondary migration, if that's the correct term, factor into the, the mm-hmm. uh, political calculation? Can you put numbers to this? Mm-hmm. Um, does this further sort of contribu- contribute to, say, the social filtering, yeah? so that those who have the most resources and are the highest education are most likely to actually make that secondary step. How does that factor into um, your view of the problem? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Thanks a lot. Well, maybe then a round of answers? Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I hope I won't speak too long. Okay, um, let's start um, with the first question. How did it play out demographically? <laughs> uh, frankly, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't check up those numbers. Um, so, um, I mean, the, 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 for Austria, I mean, the, 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 the refugees from former Yugoslavia, I know it a little bit, I don't know it about Sweden, I have to admit that. Um, so in Austria, they have, so to say, a mainstream demographic development, uh, slightly more children, uh, but they're just living there. Um, what you sometimes find is that people who had to return, who were forcibly repatriated, and, and then already it, uh, goes to your question, um, that then later on they tried to get out of Bosnia because they couldn't start a new life there. And now they are restricted. They need a visa, and it's, it's no freedom of movement to the European Union. Um, but, you know, sometimes the so-called reunification of families, having relatives, that's a way then to get out or to get there to immigrate. So sometimes they try to join their families. Very often the refugees were also split, you know, some um, ending up in Austria and in, in, in Germany and Sweden. And then, okay, so the people were sent back from Germany joining relatives or people they knew somewhere else, like in Austria. So that is already secondary migration. Um, so there is, it, it then, you know, there's kind of a, a repatriation, but then a renewed migration. I mean, these things are never a one-way road. It always, something is trickling on. Um, now, that then relates to your question. Uh, the secondary migration, yes, that was an important element. And sometimes, even under the premises of the uh, Geneva Convention, um, over time, the US and Canada became the largest, you can say, recipient states, um, also after the mid 1990s. So they took in uh, Bosnians, mostly Bosniaks, if you want to distinguish. Um, Muslim, well, whatever is, you know, that, that, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily practicing <laughs> Muslims. There's always this misunderstanding, um, which I wonder about many times. Um, but anyway, so if you look at the statistics, both have, I think, officially 35,000 or so, um, or more. Um, then they migrate usually to places where other uh, co-nationals have already arrived, so St. Louis is such a center uh, for the Bosnians. So yes, they very often they try to move on, um, either from Bosnia originally, or then the ones who were repatriated, then they uh, try to, to move on. Mm. I frankly don't know whether the moving on, you know, whether you have any social correlation there. I mean, I also worked as a social historian, but I didn't see the proper statistics and I never tried to create any of those on my own. We would have to consult uh, the right migration historians. Probably um, to be found here in this country, right, in, in Bosnian above all Bosnian communities. It's much more significant among the Bosnians than among the Croats. Uh, why? Because, well, Croatia then was a functioning state and uh, could much easier absorb uh, people returning and them also offering them a new future. However, also in Croatia, they didn't have very often an out-migration uh, that people who uh, returned to former Serb-occupied areas, which were anyhow economically peripheral, poor before, then, you know, next generation might just um, get out. Yeah. So, um, 
So, but for sure it is co-determined by people having the resources to do that, knowing how to apply for a green card, all sorts of things, being more active, being more mobile, but I don't can give you any precise information which would be needed here, so this is uh, not, not a very convincing answer in my view, but at least hopefully a partial one. Um, and then to your question, the interconnectedness, thanks for it pertaining to the South Caucasus cases. I mean, there's the older one, Georgia. Uh, I happened to see the refugee camps even in Skaltuba and other places in the beginning of the millennium. Uh, that was an interesting sight. Yeah. Um, yes, they have encouraged a return and then you might still have minefields and all sorts of uh, problems and the, the wartime destruction, uh, the debris, all that not being removed so that then is a hard region, a, a hard fate and a hard life. Um, but that has been done many times, right, by nation states which were attacked by neighboring states or then maybe uh, minorities cooperating with the external enemy. Um, that they're being sent back as kind of a bulwark, as kind of ethnic uh, securitization of the border. So then if refugees from Abkhazia, well, then had to return to towns near to the border, um, that is, of course, problematic. But yes, they were sent there. Um, Ukraine, as far as I know, did not do that. Um, but I'm not entirely sure. But as far as I know, they didn't do that. Um, so the major hub for refugees from the Donbass, I mean, besides Kyiv, uh, was Kharkiv, reinvigorating now the resistance against the Russians and the war. Total miscalculation by Putin. Um, and as far as I know, there was no incentive to do that. So, you know, that they would return to, let's say, Kramatorsk or Slavyansk. Um, why they didn't do it, my guess would be a lack of resources of the Ukrainian government. Because how to incentivize, right? They would have to offer something they can't and so. Um, and enforced, they didn't try to do that. Probably that also wouldn't work. Um, and um, how is it now? That's your second question. Um, you're completely right. I mean, um, one should not only... Could you repeat the question for people on Zoom? Oh, so, yeah. oh, oh sorry, sorry. Okay, the second question is, well, sending back in, is um, in the interest of the state, that was one element of the question, but the second one um, pertained to the regions of origin. And now this is a double-faced thing. Um, of course, you know, if I pertain that it is that it is necessary for Ukraine that there is an incentivized um, re-migration. Um, that is, of course, also true for the regions of origin. Um, but then there is the trouble. Who would want to return to, let's say, Kherson? Um, or, you know, rural areas in... in uh, in the eastern part of the of the oblast Kharkiv, right, uh, where you also have still you have moving here front lines. You have people from Kherson and Kharkiv, yeah. and we can ask them. Yes, also. so so there, but eventually, for rebuilding these regions, um, then that is also uh, needed. But um, so so anyway, thanks. Yeah, the one should also. Um, have a regional perspective for that, so thank you for that uh, comment, if I may say so. Okay, so we have time for um, very more. brief questions, and actually, so I will go to people, I know some people will have time with Professor Terra after, so I will pri prioritize those who don't. So, Greta, this gentleman, and Scott. So, Scott, do you want to start, but briefly, please? And brief response. Yes, sorry, I answered too long. No, no, you're yeah. the guest. This is more of a, a challenge. You were awfully nice about the governments of Central Europe in 2015 onwards mm -hmm. who would be offered 200 Syrian refugees and respond like it was Suleiman at the gates of Vienna. So given the amount of explicitly Islamophobic rhetoric we heard for 10 years from Slovakia, Poland, etc., 
how do you downplay the Islamophobia in explaining the different responses? Okay, thanks for the question. We collect, right? Yeah. Uh, you spoke about um, the movement of refugees as a strategy of ethnic cleansing, but of course another version of this strategy was the abduction of Ukrainians and especially mm. children. And I realize it's a it's kind of a different issue and it pales in comparison in terms of the numbers, even if it's several hundred thousands. But I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about how that fits into the story and if there are precedents from the Yugoslav crisis mm. or other cases of, mm -hmm. um, you know, returning of, of those kind of abducted refugees mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And there was a third one, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Greta Euling, University of Michigan. Um, I thank you for the wonderful lecture, and I was very intrigued by the framing of um, juxtaposing humanitarianism and utilitarianism. I noticed that all of your examples are post-Cold War, and I was wondering if looking at the Cold War period might, in, uh, like the, um, at the actual Cold War period, might enable you to flesh out this juxtaposition of humanitarianism and, util and utilitarianism because to a certain extent they always overlap. Mm. I think in particular of places like Uganda or just say the African continent during the Cold War in which the United States or the Soviet Union would um, provide funds to those African countries who were accepting refugees from other African countries mm -hmm. And it was an implicit deal. I say this having also um, worked in policy analysis with the UN Refugee Agency. Mm -hmm. um, it was an implicit deal that they received money that could then be put into uh, develop economic development, roads, uh, sanitation. Um, and so it occurred, I, I guess my question is, is the Cold War period relevant to your mm -hmm. construction? Does that help you expand this argument in some way? And then secondarily, is what we are really talking about here, does, human, does the humanitarian logic, is that really just the explicit logic that covers over an implicit logic, which is the utilitarian one? <laughs> because I feel like there is always an implicit utilitarian okay. logic operating. All right. Well, thanks a lot. I will try to be really quick this time. Then maybe we can even have more questions. Um, well, um, you know, the, the first question, um, Muslimophobia, well, or Islamophobia, that is a term invented by Iranian mullahs to trying to uh, wave off criticism originally. No, I, I'm not saying that it doesn't exist. Um, with the countries, um, one really needs to distinguish. Um, you know, so I have to refute the et cetera. And, um, I mean, Orban, okay, this is a clear-cut far-right uh, propaganda tool. Kaczynski the same. Um, Czech Republic, mm, um, the main rhetoric is rather, of course, sometimes attacks, but the, the, rather, the bottom line is rather, we don't want to have this kind of trouble France is having. Mm -hmm. And Babish owns a villa in the, back, uh, in the back hills behind Nizza, so he was there when the attack happened. Um, Slovakia, depending on the time, and um, so sure, there's um, was xenophobia, I would say, above all, uh, playing out, and then with, an, with a dose of changing dose of um, um, of you know, Islamo, well, anti-Islamism or anti-anti-Islam attitudes. Yeah, I'm a little careful, I'm wary about the Islamophobia. Um, sure, that, that that is a tool of those far right governments. Um, but we need to distinguish between them. Um, and also we have now very different results, thank God. Um, um, only Orban is left at the moment. Um, and feeds up, but that's something different. Um, abdication of Ukrainians, well thanks, I almost take that as a, uh, as a comment. Well this is proof of actually the genocidal intentions and in why this rightly so persecuted as such. So this is now the argument for bringing Putin and uh, his helpers to court. Um, but this is a different issue showing that Russia indeed thinks that it can destroy um, the Ukrainian nation also on demographic terms. And by, um, well, Russifying Uk Ukrainians and of course then, well, with the most helpless um, and defenseless the children. 
Um, but I didn't deal with it, with it here because it's a different issue. But overall, I would say, um, well, one should try to get as much as possible to get those uh, abducated children, teenagers, and so on out of Russia, but that's very difficult. Um, another question um, about humanitarianism and, and utilitarianism in the Cold War. I didn't pertain to the Cold War because of time reasons. I do in this um, uh, refugee book. There's much longer chapters about the Cold War. Um, now, this is trouble, and, and thank you for your comment that this overlaps. Sure. Um, and I mean, even if we take the humanitarian arguments or argumentation in the Cold War, we are morally superior. Look how people want to run away, and here is the open border. Um, this, of course, had um, um, was a component of the ideational warfare, so it was useful, <laughs> right? Um, so even there, on a the very principled ground, um, you never can take a humanitarian argument uh, at face value, but this is normal source critique, which it, historians should always apply. Um, so there is an overlap there, of course. Um, now, the incentives for uh, uh, nowadays they're called Global South countries, back then third world countries, to accept refugees. Um, this is only happening in parts of the world, and I find it quite interesting that this works only in countries which are um, rather Christian and Muslim, and rather post-British, um, I mean, post-colonial in the, in the sense, and where apparently the West or the United Nations thought that they can also, um, that they have a fruitful soil for those kind of arguments, okay? That uh, accepting, supporting um, refugees is something which the local government might take up, but I'm not an expert for African history, so um, I uh, will leave it at that. Um, now, the utilitarian elements of accepting refugees in the Cold War is also the economic situation, uh, economic so-called miracles, and a need for labor, which then sometimes was even abused, and there's good books about that. <laughs> what happened, for example, to Hungarians arriving in the United States. It's a very mixed story. Um, even if you look at the very much quoted positive example like Canada, um, okay, there's a humanitarian response, let's say, to the displaced persons, but then a quite cruel selection. Um, you know, who is healthy, who is not, even we can say health or anthropological inspections. Um, so, uh, again, this was combined, yeah. Um, this is why I'm making the point that this, I mean, I would say purely humanitarian concerns, with, with which I, to a degree, also sympathize, um, that that got stronger, I think, rather as a result of the post-68 um, changes overall in, 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 in politics, but also in the, in the societies. Now, this was a long answer. Um, I'm open for more questions. If but you we like, we have to, we are kicked out here? We're, okay. We're, yeah, we're out of time. So, okay, I'm uh, sorry. Then the answers the were too long. <laughs> no, the answers were perfect. The okay. questions were perfect. And we thank our public for coming today and yeah. to our guests, of course, to travel all the way to Ann Arbor. Thank you very much. And please join me. Okay, thanks again. Thank you.